everyone, and thank you for joining us for our second episode of Exploring the Paranormal with Dr. Heather Lee. I'm excited to bring um, a special guest. For those of you who have watched A&E's Ghost Hunters, you know who this is, so he needs no introduction. But what intrigues me the most about Brandon is his need, or not need, but desire to include science in the paranormal research. And that is my specialty for those of you who watched me before and on the other shows. And I just love the fact that you try to bring science into this field. And that is what we so much need. But before um, I let Brandon talk a little bit, I'm going to uh, just do a quick introduction. He has more than 200 public and private locations that he's investigated with his team, the American Paranormal Research Association. And he is also the co-author of Elements of a Haunting, which I am, like I told Brandon before we started, I am so bummed my copy won't be here till tomorrow. So I couldn't even read it. Um, so real quick, Brandon, um, why don't you tell everybody a little bit more about yourself for those who don't know who you are and kind of give us an idea of what got you interested in the paranormal. Yeah, I got interested in the paranormal field uh, at a pretty young age. Uh, in 1995, I lost my oldest brother to cancer. And in 2004, I lost another brother to suicide. So that kind of sent me on my journey into the unexplained uh, and into the paranormal. And uh, I started an organization called the American Paranormal Research Association in 2006 and been doing it ever since. Uh, but before I actually ever set foot into the field, I met, I read as much literature as I possibly could on ghosts and hauntings from psychic perspective, scientific perspective, metaphysical, anything. So uh, I wanted to get as much knowledge as possible prior to getting out actively into the field and uh, you know, actively investigating cases. So it really stems from the death of my brothers um, that really got me into the, uh, you know, the thought process about a possible existence of a life after death. And, you know, ever since 2006, I've been actively investigating and uh, I've had some pretty cool results. So it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, um, that, that's one of my favorite things about the paranormal field is a lot of people get involved because of personal experiences that they've had. And this field is a way for all of us to get or try to get answers or at least try to help the next generation get answers. We get them closer to the answers that they're looking for. So okay. um, what inspired you to write Elements of a Haunting? Uh, you know, Mustafa and I, when we first started working together on Ghost Hunters, um, you know, we saw a lot of the common mistakes that were happening within the paranormal field and within the genre, specifically with the entertainment aspect of, of the genre and the TV shows that, you know, are out there. And we really wanted to, you know, put our heads together and kind of put together a comprehensive uh, book that showed our methodology, our ideas, our opinions. Um, you know, of course, there's no right or wrong way to investigate the paranormal. There's a lot of different theories out there and a lot of different ideas. Uh, but we felt that, you know, the scientific perspective was, you know, the most credible. And for, you know, for us to step out of the shadow of pseudoscience, we felt that something uh, like this book had to be written. And so that was something him and I talked about for a year and a half on Ghost Hunters, and we started writing it on the road. And not only do we talk about, you know, the ethics, standards, protocol, and methodology that we use on our cases, but we also talk about a classification system that we've implemented uh, into the book and into our research. Um, and that idea really came to me by working with Dr. Harry Clore. Um, he's one of the only people to receive two PhDs simultaneously in any discipline. And so and I've worked with closely for about 10 years now. And when I asked him about, you know, paranormal investigation and the lack of scientific credibility, uh, uh, he did mention that there has to be some form of classification system, uh, you know, and factual data collection and empirical evidence. So um, going into a, a zoo, you don't say you saw a bunch of animals. You say you saw lions and tigers, uh, elephants, monkeys, things like that. And with the paranormal field, it's mainly, is it haunted or not residual intelligent? And we really wanted to um, implement a classification system, uh, a terminology. And that's something we've done with Elements of a Haunting. And, you know, we're very excited about it. We hope that people uh, can take that and build upon it and uh, make it, you know, kind of an open source uh, idea and theory. And hopefully we can all build upon that. And one thing you touched on real quick um, when you were talking, you had mentioned that you guys noticed common mistakes made. Do you care on uh, sharing any of those mistakes? Can you say that one more time? Sorry, my audio oh, cut out. That's OK. You had mentioned that there were common mistakes that everyone makes in the paranormal field. Do you feel like sharing some of those mistakes? I, I know we all hate hearing that we've made a mistake, but I, so I'm kind of curious as to which ones you've noticed. I'm so sorry. The audio keep, oh. keeps cutting in and out. I'm so sorry. I can't. <laughs> that, that's OK. 
let me let me rerun this really quick one sorry one no problem okay well we wait for brandon to come back feel free guys to ask any questions um i'm just gonna scroll through the chat here real quick um hi don hi brian and brandon is back hey can you hear me now there we go okay <laughs> Basically, I was asking, like, what were the common mistakes that you were noticing in the paranormal field? The audio, I'm, I'm so sorry, Heather, but the audio on your end, it's, it sounds very slow and I cannot hear exactly. It's like, it sounds like uh, it's almost slowed down. I am so sorry. Let me, this was working earlier today, so I'm not sure what's going on. Let me try, let me actually, whoops, wrong one. <laughs> I cannot, I can hear there. I'm sorry about that. Looks like it shows the mics uh, muted on my end. It shows, I think. Does that work? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, it's uh, it's it sounds like there's it's very slow. There's like a voice modulator on it or something, but uh, it, it definitely sounds better. So okay, I was like while I was messing around, I hit it on mute, so I'm not sure what I did. I feel, oh my goodness, and I just checked everything before we went live too. I feel so embarrassed. <laughs> Um, but basically I was asking what, um, mistakes do you notice people make in the field? I'm so sorry. I didn't hear that again. I'm so sorry. Oh no. Um, I'm so sorry. I cannot, that, just, that's uh, okay. it, like, cuts in and out again. And it's just, uh, it sounds, it, it sounds like, uh, you know, like in those like documentaries and movies where they hide someone's identity. That's what it sounds like. <laughs> I feel so terrible. <laughs> Uh, so unfortunately, I guess I'm going to have to reschedule you with you if that's okay. Yeah, that's not a problem. Okay. Cause I'm not sure what's going on and rather than have everybody and waste your time sitting here trying to figure it out. Um, but yeah, I'll have to test it again and I need to get it fixed before my next live in two hours. <laughs> so, but I'll message you and we'll reschedule. Can you hear me yet? Sorry, guys. Um, we're having it, it's Brandon's Bluetooth. I was wondering about that. So it's not me. I just need to check because I have to go live later. So if anyone can let me know, Liz, you say you can hear me fine. Angela, you can hear me. Hold on a second. Brandon messaged me. I feel terrible. So, um, yeah. Okay. So everyone, okay. Okay. Hey there guys. So sorry about that. Um, I am actually going to reach out and so we've had to reschedule Brandon as you guys, for those of you just joining us, I feel terrible. But if anyone, I'm checking up, I'm trying to get a guest on, but if you guys have any questions about the paranormal, feel free to ask. I don't want to waste um, 
yeah, he's checking right now, Anne, and um, he apologizes, and I apologize for that. I hope it, you know, like I said, I hoped it wasn't on my end. Um, but feel free to ask any questions you have about the paranormal. Um, again, we we're supposed to be talking about the um, Elements of a Haunting, which was his new book that he wrote with Mustafa, and I can't wait to read it. It's a book that I have coming in tomorrow, unfortunately. It's not here yet. So, um, and real quick while we're wasting some time and you guys are all saying hi, I'm so glad you're joining me again. I, I feel totally, totally embarrassed, but my next show, I'm gonna still stay on for the next hour or so. So if you guys have any questions, feel free to ask while I come up with a quick topic. But on February 2nd, I will be doing my presentation on non-tech tools. So yeah, thank you, Annie, for your help. Thank you, everybody, for sticking around while we were trying to figure that out. Um, and if Brandon comes back, we'll make sure we get him in. And I am just checking a few things. So again, like I said, non-tech tools. For those of you who know and have been watching me for a while, you know that I love using non-tech tools. Um, that's my second favorite thing to... Uh, dealing with the scientific method, which is going to be another topic. And I was hoping to touch that with um, Brandon tonight. But Angela, go ahead and ask your question. So as soon as I see your question, I'll make sure I pull it up. And I'm not seeing it yet. It's okay. So I'm still waiting for your question, Angela, and for anyone else. Um, so hi, everybody. I saw Bob hop on earlier. Hi, Georgia. And, and like I said, I'm research. I'm scrolling through all of my stuff. Okay, and Brandon says he's going to try jumping back on real quick to see if that works. Okay. Okay, if you hear it in your mind, um, I call I personally call that clear audience. Oh, hi, Bob. Thank you for still being here. Um, that's basically just hearing there's a whole bunch. I suppose I could turn my light back on after I turned it off. Um, that's where you can hear voices. Um, a lot of times it's it's, you know, the psychic abilities of the spirits, your psychic abilities, being able to pick up on them. And it's um, one of the clear, yeah, I'm like, I'm so frustrated. Hold on one second. And yeah, can you hear me now? Yes. Perfect. <laughs> okay. I was scrambling to find a topic. I'm like, what do I talk about? <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. About, it was so weird. It literally sounded just like when you watch the news and they hide someone's identity. And right. It was so like it, it was like slow down and the pitch was really low and then like I would see your mouth moving and then the audio would come in. I was like, whoa. So <laughs> uh, I was freaking out there for a minute. I'm like, what time? I was like going through all of my uh, slideshows saying, what can I pull up that they haven't seen before? <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> but, it sounds great now though. So perfect. Okay. Well, thank you for coming back. And um, everyone, Angela says that she can hear you now. And um, I was just helping Angela answer a question. But the one question I had for you was. Yeah. What's the biggest mistake you see paranormal investigators make? You know, that assuming everything is supernatural. You know, I see that commonly um, with the shows, with documentaries, also within the field. Because, you know, a lot of what people see on the shows and with, you know, you know paranormal entertainment, per se, um, it gets mimicked within the field. And you never see a lot of critical thinking or finding natural, logical explanations first and foremost before jumping to the conclusion that something is, you know, supernatural, uh, goes to haunting, things like that. So you see a lot of devices specifically made for paranormal research, um, devices that really are not giving factual data or empirical evidence. And again, there's no right or wrong way to do it. And there may be theories and devices out there that are created for that purpose that do make advancements or do help advance the field. But a lot of times you, you just don't see um, a logical approach per se uh, in finding you know, staying on Earth and starting here and finding a logical explanation prior to jumping to the conclusion that something is supernatural. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's the one thing that always um, I, I deal with a lot. It's the uh, it's a demon. It, it's clients call you and it's a demon. They automatically know it's one with no research, no nothing. Right. And, and then the paranormal investigators feed into that. 
They're mm -hmm. like, oh, it's a demonic haunting. I got to get my hands on this one. Yeah, it could be very dangerous. You know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, people, again, it's a huge psychological, uh, you know, there's a huge psychological aspect to it where people consume content, media, movies, things like that. And then they, you know, it's kind of a natural reaction to almost uh, assume the worst sometimes. And then mm -hmm. going into a situation like that and then having a paranormal team that feeds into that, just like you said, it could be a very dangerous situation. And the mind is such a powerful thing. It can really complicate that situation and make it a lot more difficult to handle. And then hopefully you get a good team in there, someone that, you know, people that are logical, that have, you know, rational type of thinking that can really calm that down and give some explanations that, you know, nine times out of 10, it's not going to be something demonic or evil, things like mm -hmm. that. It's a very rare occurrence. And uh, I hope that, you know, people going out there and investigating, especially in private homes like that, you know, take that into consideration that, you know, it's, it's a very rare occurrence. And when it does happen, you have to call in people that are, you know, very experienced with that. And uh, mm -hmm. there's not a lot of people out there that have that credential. Right. And, and that's what I always liked about um, when you were on Ghost Hunters, it was you, you guys took a more scientific approach. You tested out new theories. You tested out new equipment and you also found, ex, you know, explanations. So you weren't afraid to go to the homeowner or property owner and be like, hey, look, you're not haunted. You know, he, here's what's really going on. And I've always really liked that and respected that of you when you did your investigations. Thank you. Yeah, it, it could be difficult to do that, you know, to go into a situation with a client that can be so convinced that something supernatural is happening. And then when you actually provide, you know, information, you know, actual data and, you know, logical explanations to things, it can be difficult sometimes to get someone out of that way of thinking. And, you know, there's been times where we've done that and it didn't end well with the client per se, but I mean, we're always there to help in any way we can. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, you know, we're not there to find a ghost per se. We're there to try and find answers and, you know, we're willing to do that at any cost. Okay. And then getting back to your book real quick, what was your favorite part about writing it? Oh man, you know, it's, you know, what's funny is I, you know, I've, I'm not a writer. Mustafa, that's kind of his thing. You know, he's, he writes for Distractify. He's got a degree in writing and, uh, for me, it was something completely new. You know, I, I'm used to, I'm a filmmaker. Uh, I've worked in television for many years, so I'm used to that medium. And so for me to jump into the writing and literary world was you know, very different for me. It was very difficult. Um, there's a lot more to it than people realize. Uh, but for me, you know, the, my favorite part was being able to go through and relive some of these moments that we've had over the past 17 years with APRA and some of that research and to really, um, get into a situation into a mindset where you can really break it down and explain it to people in a way that you can't with television or you can't with a uh, documentary film and that was a really great experience for me is to be able to express myself in that way and to express the research in that sense to really provide all the details and all the facts and, and provide a very detailed explanation of what's going on so that was a very enjoyable experience for me and then I know you talked a little bit about science and how do you feel science plays a part in the paranormal field? You know, I think science plays a huge part into the paranormal field. And I mean, some of the most brilliant scientists in the world had a belief of not only things that were supernatural or things above the normal, paranormal. I mean, Nikola Tesla, Albert Einstein, uh, Isaac Newton, people like that very much believed in that. And, you know, science is about exploring the unknown. That's a big part of science. And to me, I think that there's a lot of things that are happening in our world and in our realm that we believe to be ghosts and hauntings that may be a phenomena that science can't quite explain. And I think that the only way to really get there and the only way to really have a better understanding of what we're dealing with is through science and really, you know, testing theories, uh, getting out there and using technology that's usually dedicated to scientific industries and scientific fields and implementing that technology and that thought process into our own work within the paranormal field. I think that's uh, instrumental into not only us finding more answers, but also into us stepping out of the shadow of pseudoscience. But, you know, a lot of times science gets this rap for being the big bad wolf of the paranormal, something that's gonna shoot everything we believe down or things that we want to believe down. But in all reality, that's not the case. Um, it's gonna be very, you know, helpful and instrumental into us explaining and understanding what's really going on. So for me, the scientific approach uh, is crucial and something I implement and I've been very lucky to work with brilliant medical doctors, engineers, scientists, people from various technical industries that have helped me implement those ideas and, and processes into what we do. 
Um, but, you know, I think that science is the answer and science is the key to, you know, what we believe to be the unknown. Okay. And then what can you offer um, as a tip for paranormal investigators and researchers to help make this field be less of a pseudoscience? You know, first and foremost, I would say, you know, don't believe everything you see on television, <laughs> first and foremost. But, uh, you know, it's all about critical thinking and logic, you know, trying to find that natural explanation first. You go into a location, you hear the reports, the eyewitness testimony, think of what naturally could explain some of those things, you know, and, and start there. Start with the, the logic and then, then move away from there. But I always say, you know, using devices specifically made for paranormal research usually is counterproductive to what we're trying to do. Again, there's no right or wrong way to do it. Some of those devices may provide some information, but if we want to you know, be taken seriously by not only the public, but the scientific community, we have to provide factual data and empirical evidence. And the only, reason, the only way we could do that is by implementing technology from those third parties and actually speaking to experts from those third parties that can give us an explanation as to what's something that's natural, what's something that can't be explained. So using devices like data loggers that are used in environmental studies, things like that can be very beneficial. Understanding what the environmental conditions are of a location, what's happening within that environment that can be something that's naturally explained that can cause something that we believe to be supernatural or if there is something actually taking place we can't explain, what are the conditions associated with that? So to me, first and foremost is adapting technology, adapt, adapting the thought process and methodology from other technical industries into what we're doing is gonna take us a lot further than mimicking what we're seeing on the shows and buying devices that are meant to communicate with ghosts and spirits, whatever you wanna call them. I think that could be very counterproductive and it also provides a lot of false positives that is not beneficial to the field. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I know one of my goals in this field is to come up with, um, I know it's difficult because the scientific method doesn't 100% apply to the paranormal field because you can't get a ghost to act on command. But um, how do you feel the scientific method, you know, my goal, like I said, is to make a standardized way of, so that way we can all share the same evidence, the same type of stuff and see across the board. So how do you think the scientific method fits in the field? I think that's uh, what you said is perfect, you know, is there has to be some form of open source way to share data, right? And that's going out and trying to find, again, evidence and uh, empirical evidence and factual data and finding out if there's an explanation to that, right? And once we have data that we can't explain, for instance, say you're in a location and you're investigating and you start to capture uh, amazing you know, pressure changes within a location and you capture something visually that's anomalous or audibly that's anomalous and those correlate together the idea would be to take that information have all that environmental data from you know barometric pressure temperature humidity uh, emf uh, and having those environmental conditions and putting that into an open source way where you talk to other investigators that have had a very similar experience and you compare and contrast that data and how does that add up but again like you said the scientific method it's can be difficult to implement into paranormal research. Uh, like you said, controlled environments is very difficult. Having something happen on command is almost impossible. But if we can start to see what the environmental conditions are associated with these events, and we start to see a pattern and a correlation between them, we may be able to understand that we could go to a location that's said to be haunted. These exact data and parameters are set the pressure is exactly at this when we had this occurrence. The humidity is exactly at this when this occurrence happened. And if we can see that correlation between those environmental, you know, that environmental data, maybe we can start to predict events. So that is possible. But I think that, you know, data is key, uh, environmental data specifically, and having an understanding of what that environment is. And can we replicate that environment to see if an event happens that we, you know, think is paranormal? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it's like one experiment that I always tell people to try if you want to test the scientific field is to get an Eddie Plus meter and set it in the same place, the same time every day, but then also document what the weather was like, what the temp, you know, any um, barometric pressure. I know that the Eddie Plus takes a lot of that um, as far as like the motion and the EMFs, but then also document the moon phase. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And, and so it's everybody's like, oh, that's easy to do. And I'm like, that mm -hmm. is the first step to, you know, getting this information. Exactly. And it's very similar to like a, fa a farmer's almanac, right? Mm -hmm. Where all of that information that's provided, that's going to predict, 
you know, the, the exact weather conditions and things of that nature for someone to go out and plant crops and things like that can be implemented into the paranormal field. Like you said, moon phase, tide charts, um, everything from, you know, like you said, barometric pressure, temperature, humidity, EMF, all those things is not only documenting all of that on a timestamp, like you mentioned, but also understanding what those conditions are and then trying to replicate those conditions at a mm -hmm. later time. So it's very important yeah. to have all that information. That's something we actually talk about in Elements of a Haunting yeah. is documenting and that specific methodology and uh, in, in having an understanding of what's happening at all times in your environment, in a location, and mm -hmm. trying to see what is different at those moments when something unexplained happens and then trying to you know data log that, have an understanding of what it is and hopefully down the line, if we have enough data and enough people have shared that data, um, we might be able to replicate those events and something may happen. It's very possible. Okay. And we have a few questions. If you don't mind, we'll jump over to those real quick. Sure. Um, Anne Marie says, do you find sometimes it's the person's attachment that's causing the paranormal activity more than the actual house? Sure. Yeah. There's a lot of times where, you know, a client or an agent, as we would call them, is the person that is uh, actually having the activity associated with with that person per se, not the location itself. Um, we actually documented that in Ghost Hunters in season one, uh, but also other cases we work not on the show where it seems that there are people that have, you know, this extra set of energy, if you will, that can manipulate the environment around them. And sometimes the people are haunted, not the location per se. So yeah, I actually have seen that on a few different occasions and have documented that where we've gone into a location, took the person out of the location, dead silent, nothing happens, just a quiet, empty house. But once that person enters the property and comes into the location, things start to happen. So yeah, absolutely, people can be a conduit for activity. And then Bob says he has a question. First of all, he knows spirits exist, though he's confused as to why we have not learned more information about the afterlife through EVPs or communicating with spirits. It seems ghosts are very tight-lipped about what's going on. What are your thoughts? <laughs> yeah, you know, I've heard so many different theories on that where I've heard theories about people saying that there's a certain uh, set of code or ethics uh, once you, <laughs> you know, once you pass away and you go to the beyond where there's only so much information you can provide. I've heard that before, but, you know, it's it, it's tough because the evidence that we've collected so far, you know, in a field as a whole, um, it, it's there's not a lot of cred credible information out there. There's not a lot of credible data, uh, unfortunately. But, you know, EVP work has always been something that really interests me. I was a sound engineer for many years. And one thing I have noticed with a lot of people that do conduct EVP work is that they use lower grade devices a lot of the time that don't have a high bit rate and don't provide a lot of information within those recordings. And a lot of times you have false positives with EVP because of those lower bit rate recordings. And you're hearing um, a loss of data within that recording uh, session or that recording um, data where it sounds like whispering or sounds like voices. But in reality, it's just a loss of information on those recordings. So it's tough because you have things like spirit boxes. You have, you know, with ITC, you have, you know, different audio devices people are using to try and record EVP. Uh, but a lot of times you don't have people that go and, you know, consult an audio engineer uh, using a spectrum analysis and breaking things down frequency by frequency. You have a lot of times where there's contamination with those recordings with uh, radio frequencies, cell phone frequencies, uh, things like that. Uh, but exactly why we're not getting a lot of information out of EVP and, you know, more messages, I'm not sure. You know, I, I continue to conduct EVP research. I continue to ask those questions, trying to get more information. And, you know, hopefully, you know, with uh, continuing that research continuing the repetitiveness of it we'll get more answers that's the goal <laughs> <laughs> okay and one thing i wanted to bring up i know it's uh we were supposed to talk about elements of haunting but i don't want to spoil it for me since i haven't read it yet <laughs> <laughs> but i was interested in your cemetery park project mm -hmm. do you want to talk a little bit more about that sure, I'm not sure yeah. if any of the listeners have uh, heard of that or I've yeah, that. No, that was that was a, a film that I directed, um, started actually directing that film and putting it together in 2017. Um, when I first moved to Ventura, California, here uh, in Southern California, uh, I moved downtown Ventura and I moved next to this place that was a park that was called Cemetery Park. And I heard a lot of legends and urban legends about that it was once a cemetery, a seven acre cemetery. And walking there and living next to it and being you know in that place on a daily basis it was hard to grasp and it was hard to understand 
But as I walked through, I started to see flush markers that had, you know, birth and death dates on it and things like that. And I thought to myself, there has to be more to this story. There has to be something more to it. And so I started to do some research here locally, and I found a man named Stephen Schlater, who did the most, you know, historical research in, on this, uh, this topic in particular. And I did find out through him that not only was this a cemetery, a seven acre cemetery from the 1800s, but the city illegally demolished the cemetery in the 1960s by uh, illegally removing the headstones and uh, discarding of them in Hall Canyon here in Ventura and throwing them out in the sea. Uh, but it was a huge political scandal here in Ventura in the 60s and it continues to this day because there's many families, descendants that cannot find the grave of their loved one because those markers are gone and were illegally taken by the city. And so I, I made a documentary film called, called Cemetery Park about that entire process of when it was established as a cemetery, what happened in the 60s and the ongoing fight with the families and Stephen Schlater against the city. And uh it was unbelievable to think that something like this happened. And I really had no idea that this was a common thing throughout the country, that mm -hmm. almost every state throughout this country has a similar story to where there are these beautiful pioneer cemeteries full of history with immigrants from all around the world, people that came here to make a better life for themselves that had something that meant so much to them taken away. I mean, death culture and death in that time period is a lot different than we perceive it today. And to them, that was a very big deal. That final step and their rest, their final resting place is something that was near and dear to their hearts. Not only the person being laid to rest there, but the families associated with that. And to find out that this atrocity happened and a city illegally taking someone's property away from them and something that meant so much to them from a, you know, a spiritual point of view or a religious point of view um, was unbelievable. So I, I had to make a film about it and I made that film and was lucky enough to get into the Santa Barbara International Film Festival, multiple award nominations for it. And it's an ever evolving situation to this day that hopefully the film could shed some light on it, not only here locally in Ventura, California, but also with cemeteries throughout the country. Yeah, it, it was almost like you were meant to move there. <laughs> yeah, very strange. I mean, just ending up there by chance, you know, there was mm -hmm. so many different places I could have moved within the city alone, but to move right next to it was definitely kismet for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I know you do a lot of directing and producing and can you tell me which part of, uh, or how, I don't want to say, do you have a favorite between writing and producing or directing and producing and ghost hunting? Oh, you know, it's, they kind of almost go hand in hand in a way because, you know, when I first started doing paranormal investigation, I felt the only way I can get the research out was through the form of visual documentaries like that. Mm -hmm. It was the easiest way to present that information because a lot of people within the field aren't going to go on and look at graphs and charts. You know, it's just some will, you know, the ghost geeks like myself will do things like that. But, I, you know, ghost hunting and documentary filmmaking kind of go hand in hand because the, document, the documentation process of a paranormal investigation is a crucial part, right? And having that documentation from the beginning of a case to the end of a case is something that can make or break a case. And mm -hmm. so I, they kind of go hand in hand. So when I'm out doing a show that's like ghost hunting per se, it, they just kind of go naturally together. So it's, you know, I, I love the documentation process and the documentary process of just letting a story unfold and let it, letting a story tell it tell itself mm -hmm. without a bias and without um, trying to make a narrative out of something that's not there. So it's exciting, you know, and I feel like ghost hunting is very similar in that regard where you go in, you let that story unfold, you present the facts as they are, and you let people make their own decision. Yeah, no, yeah, because I actually filmed a document. I was in a documentary last year. And when we went, I was asking 101 questions before we went. What do you want me to research? What do you need to know? What you And they're like, just show up and go with the flow. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> a different experience, definitely. Yeah, it's it's a lot of fun. You know, it's like like what you did, you know, is you want to be as prepared as possible, right? You mm -hmm. want to have all the information. But as funny as it is, it's a lot better for that process to, to play out on camera, right? So uh, instead of being so prepared and being ready to go for that film or ready to go for that project, it's usually best to let that pro that process unfold on camera. And that's a, it, it's kind of a hard thing to do and a hard mm -hmm. thing to get used to. But once you do it, you have something that's really special. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, it was definitely a lot of fun. Um, oops, hold on a second. I lost my questions. And 
The American Paranormal Research Association. That is your paranormal group that you founded? It is, yes. Okay. And what do you guys exactly do? Because I know you, know, you were uh, looking to do something more national is what I know. I saw you post a couple months ago. Yeah. You know, I founded APRA in 2006 and I founded the organization to solely investigate historical locations throughout the country. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, for the purposes of data collection. Um, it's not about that we don't want to go help people or work homeowner cases. That's not why. It's, to me, it was a way of expanding the paranormal field in a way of taking a national stance and a national you know, research project into data collection and open source sharing of that data in hopes of stepping out of the shadow of pseudoscience. So APRA's uh, organization, again, I founded in 06 to solely investigate historical locations throughout the United States and really basing our investigations not only off the eyewitness testimony of these historical places, but having a history associated with those locations that we believe would lend towards a haunting right, would be uh, kind of that element of a haunting. One of the elements is, you know, a very specific set of history that we believe would have some kind of, you know, phenomena associated with it. So that's always been the goal with APRA, is uh, something I've been doing over the years is slowly branching out to different states with other organizations and bringing them on board with APRA and having that open source sharing of data and really having that very set um, idea of, uh, you know, methodology, ethics, standards, and protocol that we can follow and hopefully um, step out of the shadow of pseudoscience and have an understanding of uh, what's really happening, what we believe and perceive to be supernatural phenomena. And Marie has a quick question. Have you ever been to Virginia? I have, yes. I've been to Virginia many times. Beautiful state. Uh, location I'm actually looking at hopefully moving to. I love Virginia. So much history there. Uh, a lot of historic properties uh, and a lot of phenomena from what I understand. Yeah, I was actually born in Portsmouth and I love Williamsburg. Oh, Williamsburg so. is amazing. Oh, <laughs> That's such my a favorite beautiful place. Place. one of my favorite places to go. Yeah. Um, okay. I don't know. One question we have here, but I'm not sure um, since you're more of the scientific approach, Angela, a lot of the shows that I do deal with psychics and everything, but she wants to know can you lose your ability if you don't use it? Ooh, that's, you know, I, I don't have psychic ability per se, but I am very open to the possibility. I do believe that all of us as humans have an ability. We have a sense within ourselves. It's just a matter of if we're using it and tapping into that. So um, it, for me and my belief system, again, I, I, don't, I don't believe I have psychic ability, but I believe that all of us have a natural intuition within ourselves that I don't think really goes away. It's just a matter of how in tune you are with it and how you are in tune with yourself. And I know there's a lot of great psychics out there in the field uh, that believe that you can really tap into that through different ways, meditation, things like that, different classes. So I do believe in that phenomena and that there is that ability. And I think that it's within all of us, just a matter of how in tune we are with it. And um, out of all the projects you've, do you've done, whether it's the book, your documentaries, or being on Ghost Hunters, or any of the other shows that I've seen you appear on, what is your most memorable experience? Oh, you know, I'd have to say probably season two of Ghost Hunters, uh, when I first implemented the EMCCD camera, and we captured this amazing footage at Fort Stanton in Fort Stanton, New Mexico. And just to see the results, you know, while using such a scientific piece of equipment, such a sensitive piece of equipment, and to actually go to some of the consultants I work with and to have them go, we have no idea what the hell that is, was a very special moment. And to be able to do that on a stage like Ghost Hunters and a show like that was phenomenal. And just being able to have that opportunity and be able to, you know, have a moment where a theory that, you know, we believed in actually, pro you know, provided results and produced data was a great moment. And something that, you know, Mustafa and I continue with that theory that we call it the paranormal photon theory. And something we uh, continue, you know, with to this day, and understanding that with what we believe to be ghosts and hauntings, that there is an element associated with it that is photon events. And we've also seen a correlation between photon events and barometric pressure about how those are taking place at the same time with this anomalous type of activity that we're collecting on this camera. And uh, it's it's just a phenomenal feeling to know that you have a theory, you go out and test that theory, you have some results, and you know, just to keep trying to collect data to, uh, you know, further that theory. And so that was a very exciting moment for me, definitely. Okay. And what is your favorite piece of equipment to use? Oh, that's tough. Um, <laughs> it's like picking I, a favorite child. Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> uh, 
I love audio. You know, I'm, I, I was an audio engineer for many years. I, I worked in the music industry for many years. So I, anytime you can get a great EVP that sounds like human vocal presence and human, you know, speech that can be taken into a spectrum analysis and broken down and shown that it's not a human voice, it's not contamination from a stray radio frequency or a cell phone frequency, that's always such an amazing moment. And, and I feel like you can always get the most information out of EVP. You know, you can tell a person's gender, you can tell uh, a person's age, you can you get direct questions answered like that. So uh, I'd probably have to say, you know, audio equipment of any kind. You know, I, I, I just got a Zoom H6 recently. That's an amazing device. But any any type of high quality recording device that high that you know provides you a high bit rate and a lot of information within those recordings, um, I would have to say is something I love. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm more of a, everybody has their favorite because I'm more of a photography aspect of it. That, that's my favorite part. I like going into the location before anybody gets in there and just start taking photos and seeing right. what you can capture. So um, what kind of tips, if let's say we have a paranormal team or even just a researcher who wants to be more scientific, what kind of um, things do you suggest they start doing to help make that happen? Well, first and foremost, look into the scientific method uh, and understand that. Uh, but second off, I would reach out to, you know, experts from, you know, technical industries, you know, engineers, medical doctors, scientists. There's a lot more people out there that are involved in those technical industries that are interested in this work than people realize. And going to those third parties and speaking to them about how, it, how you know, the scientific method should be implemented into this field is going to go a long way because they can show you what's right, what's wrong, how to do something, how to conduct an investigation from their point of view. And that's gonna be a very you know, huge moment for anyone in the paranormal field is learning directly from the source what's right and what's wrong, how to conduct an investigation and how to theorize, create a hypothesis, things like that, but really understanding that, you know, the scientific method. But I would say reach out to you know, experts from technical industries. Uh, don't be afraid to do so because you know, more times than not, they're interested in this type of research and they're interested in the unknown. So I would say reach out to those people um, see what they have to say, take their advice and implement that device, that advice, excuse me. Right. And, and what are your thoughts of reaching out to like local universities? So let's say you have a question and someone in the physics department could help you. Do you suggest? Absolutely. Absolutely. Academia is a great source. And mm -hmm. again, a lot, you know, more times than not, there are people involved at universities that find this fascinating and find what we're doing, you know, very, very interesting. So Absolutely. Local research, like local institutions of some kind, you know, universities, things of that nature. Um, they're all over the place. Every place has one. You know, every location has that source. So definitely reach out to them, see what they have to say. I mean, the worst that could happen is that they say no if they don't want to be involved. So right. <laughs> that's the worst. <laughs> or, or they just don't answer your email. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Um, and I know Mustafa is more of the historian of the between the two of you, but how do you feel um, history plays, like learning the history of a location, how important do you think that is needed when it comes to paranormal research? It's massive. It's massive. I know there's a lot of uh, investigators out there that, especially, you know, on the psychic side and the metaphysical side that don't want to know the history prior to going in. They don't want to be influenced, which makes perfect sense if that's the way you conduct that research. Perfect. But I believe that history is extremely important with any case. I think you need to know as much information as possible prior to going into an investigation. Mm -hmm. And history is the reason we're there a lot of the times. You know, if we believe that, you know, ghosts are, you know, a consciousness that survives death, uh, history is a huge part of that. And it's almost like time travel in a way. It's like reliving history in that sense. So that's one of the elements of a haunting that we talk about in the book that history is a huge, huge part of this field and a huge part of, you know, how we conduct our research and understanding a person's, um, you know, etiquette, understanding their culture, understanding mm -hmm. who they were as a person in life is going to, you know, provide a lot more information, a lot more of an edge in your investigation is understanding mm -hmm. who these people were, how they lived their lives, where they came from and how they died. And I think that's going to provide a lot of information. So history is extremely mm -hmm. important. Do as much historical research as possible. It'll it'll take you a lot further. Mm -hmm. And also, I mean, knowing the history, you can guide your questions, your EVP questions. You know, because I always tell people you're not going to ask the same question at a mental hospital or a sanatorium as you would at a hotel. Exactly. You know, you, yeah. you need to. And there's only so many times you can ask. 
uh, what year is it? <laughs> or how did <laughs> exactly. you die? You know, I'm going to think of them as people, you know, going in and having mm -hmm. a casual conversation. If you keep repeating these things, you probably won't have as much communication if uh, it's the same thing over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, definitely. Um, Don Marie wants to know, who would you want to investigate with that you have not yet had an opportunity to? Oh, man, that's that's a tough question as well. Uh, you know, I've been very lucky to work with Dr. Harry Clore. He's someone I've looked up to for so many years and having him come out in investigations and actively be in the field was amazing. Um, uh, you know, we got to investigate with Grant Wilson. That was amazing. Uh, gosh, it's, you know, from the scientific perspective, I would love to work with someone like uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, someone like that, you know, just to bring them out and to understand their mm -hmm. thought process, what they believe, you know, from that point of view. But historically, if I was talking about any figure in history, I'd probably have to say Nikola Tesla would be mm -hmm. unbelievable. <laughs> he would be the yeah. perfect person to go out with. <laughs> Him or Isaac Newton would be great. Uh, but yeah, it, those those figures I would have to say would be someone I would want to investigate with, you know, if it's we're talking about a historical context. Mm -hmm. And I know you posted, uh, I think it was today or yesterday, that you have an amazing project coming up. Are you able to share any information about that yet? I can say that Mustafa and I will be shooting eight episodes here next month, or actually in a couple of weeks we leave. I can't give much more information than that. Uh, I can say that we're going to be doing something very out of the box, uh, something that's very special to us. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, and you're going to be seeing some new faces involved in that project as well, which is going to be very nice for the field, I believe, in the entertainment aspect of it. You see a lot of the same faces, a lot of the same types of shows. Uh, I say a lot of the times that the shows you see now are kind of the same show dressed up with a different name. And I don't mean that negatively. I'm not trying to say that in, in a negative way. But it, it's going to be nice to have some fresh thinking, a uh, new perspective, and having people that have not been on that stage before involved is going to be a lot of fun. Um, but we'll have more information, you know, coming up very soon. And we're very excited to be able to provide that information once we're able to. Okay. Yeah, it'll be nice. Um, the shows, I, like you said, they're the same show basically, but with different people in them and it's not a bad thing, but it's what sells. Yeah. <laughs> and that's why they're all the same. And it would be very, very nice to see something fresh and something new. Yeah, exactly. And that's, field. you know, with us, you know, you know, since we did ghost hunters, it's been almost two years since we did the last episode for season two and, you know, there's been some opportunities that have come along in the, you know, I've been asked to be part of some projects and I was just waiting for the right one. You know, it's it's not about being on TV for me. That's not my goal. It never was my goal. You know, again, my interest in this field, you know, stems from the death of my brothers and just trying to understand is there a possible existence of a life after death? Does consciousness survive death? And so for me, it was just waiting for the right opportunity to be able to implement some of my, you know, thinking and without having to be put inside of a box as far as this is what the entertainment aspect expects of you. And this is what, you know, the network expects of you, things like that. So it's finally that, you know, that opportunity came along and, you know, Mustafa and I took it and we're very excited to show everyone what we've been working on for the last couple of years and uh, implementing those ideas, that methodology, that line of thinking uh, into a show and really, um, you know, putting that out for the world to see. We're very excited about it. Yeah. Looking forward to that one. Um, and I know you've done work with Flumery Produ uh, Productions or Promotions with Ray. Yeah. And do you have any upcoming events that you want to share with everybody? Yeah, we do. We actually, uh, Soft and I will be at two events here uh, in March, at the very beginning of March. We'll be at the Grand Victorian Inn in Kentucky. Beautiful place. Can't wait to get out there. I mean, it just looks phenomenal. Uh, and then we'll also be at the Old Stone Jail. And we'll be doing that as a benefit for uh, Save Waverly Hills with Ernie okay. Pack and Denise. And uh, so we'll be at both of those. I think they're a day apart. I think it's the fourth and the fifth. So we'll be at the Old Stone Jail and the Grand Victorian Inn. So you can find that on my Facebook page or go to Flumeri's page and see it there. But uh, we'll be doing those two events back to back. And we'll actually have some books there with us. And we'll be doing signings for that, which is going to be a very rare thing to see uh, Masaf and I in the same place at the same time to get a book signed. So uh, it'll be a lot of fun. And oh, another quick question came in, and then we're getting close to the hour mark, so I'll get let you go soon. Um, do you believe in heaven and hell, the religious side of things? You know, I, I don't really look at everything from a religious context. You know, I'm not a religious person, per se. I, I would say I'm a spiritual person. Um, but I believe that what 
you know, heaven or hell is, is a person's own making and their own thought process. So I don't really believe in, in, in it from a religious context per se, or a religious perspective. Uh, but I, I, I think that, you know, the more I've done this in the years I've been investigating, I believe that energy is neither created nor destroyed, which we know. And, and I do think that there is a, a consciousness that's retained after death, how that manifests itself and how that comes about. I'm not exactly sure, but I think the more we look into quantum physics, uh, uh, things like that, I think that we can have a better understanding that what we perceive to be the paranormal isn't as above the normal as we believe. And I think that with the advancement of technology and the more people from the scientific community and other communities coming on board, I think that we'll have more answers as time goes on. Okay. And if anyone wants to try to find you, I have your Facebook page. I think I got it right at Brandon J. Alvis. Yep. And then your website as well, www.brandonjalvis.com. A lot of interesting things on his website. It looks like you have a lot of interesting documentaries there. Yeah, and yeah. It's, you I, truly I, love your work. Thank you, thank you. I, I love history. You know, I'm a huge history buff. And anytime I can tell a piece of strange and told history, I'm all about it. Um, I love to keep history alive in any way I possibly can through documentary work, through paranormal investigation mm -hmm. and going to these locations, helping, you know, try and raise funds for them. For instance, like we're trying to do with, you know, Save Waverly Hills. Uh, so I love history and any chance I can talk about it and show uh, information people don't know about, I'm all about it. Perfect. Okay, well, thank you again for joining us. I'm going to wrap this up and let you get on with your evening. Thank it's you not so as much. And sorry for the technical it's... stuff. Oh, no, <laughs> that's okay. That. I was starting to freak out. I'm like, I, <laughs> I thought it was me and I have another show later to do. But you can find me on February 2nd back here at 7 p.m. Eastern for my presentation and discussion on non-tech tools for the paranormal investigation. So I'm going to show you all the different ways that you can investigate without needing anything technical. That's, those are my favorite tools to play around with. <laughs> so again, thank you, Brandon. I'm just checking. Yep. No more questions. Thank you again for joining. And I cannot wait to get the book tomorrow and actually dive in and start reading it. Awesome. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Thank you. You have a great night. You too. Bye.